Hi, I'm Michelle Ferris and I'm talking cycling with Rob at Ride Media. I'm excited to be talking to Michelle Ferris. We've known each other for years and tomorrow yeah. she gets inducted into the Cycling Australia Hall of Fame. Talk to me about it. Is that a, 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 an accolade that you've been waiting all your life for? Uh, no, honestly not, I don't think so. Um, it was uh, a great honour to um, receive the, the email to say that this year I would be inducted. Um, it has been a few years since retirement and, you know, life has just, you know, moved on and working, family life and things like that. Um, spent many years wondering uh, about my career, but, you know, and then sort of got to a point now where i have uh, very uh, lucky to have achieved what I achieved, um, met the people that I met and um, the, the results as well. So, um, you know, it's, it'll, be, it'll be great to, to be inducted uh, alongside some of the great um, cycling heroes of Australia, Australian cycling. Pretty exciting to be honest because you join the likes of Danny Clark yeah. this year. Danny's influence is immense for many, many years. Yeah. Yours is a shorter career, but yeah. do you want to just sort of try and paraphrase what you saw as the highlights? For me, obviously, uh, Olympics were the highlights. Um, Commonwealth Games at, you know, just 17, 18 years old and first experience. And, you know, going in the team with the likes of Gary Newand and, uh, you know, Kathy Watt and things like that. Um, there were some pretty uh, great achievements and some you know, times where I sort of, you know, had to pinch myself to think, you know, I'm 17 years old, I'm getting to represent my country. Um, but I'm pretty excited to be uh, inducted tomorrow with, with Danny Clark. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool feeling and he's done so much for the sport. He's a cool guy, um, great bike rider. So that's probably, you know, pretty exciting for me too, absolutely. I think it was one of the first few people that were, or females that were invited into the Institute of Sport um, down in Adelaide, um, which was, uh, you know, a fairly tough time for most athletes and I think particularly for females at the time. Um, we weren't really given that, I guess, as many opportunities to sort of thrive. Um, there was a lot of, you know, stuff thrown in our in the way to try and you know really see whether we were going to make it as athletes or, or track cyclists. Um, I've spent probably many years thinking about my time in Adelaide and my experiences and times that I um, absolutely hated. Um, I have times where I wonder why I continued to stay there and be treated um, like I was at times. Um, but, you know, I had a great coach in Gary West, um, you know, who helped me understand things about myself and also as a writer. And uh, I think if it wasn't someone like him, um, there's no way that I would have continued on in that program at that time. I spent many years wanting to, you know, I guess make a big deal out of it, make it known, um, I guess try to get a little bit of recognition not only for um, my achievements at, in, in cycling but also I guess my achievements as hanging in there as one of the early female riders that sort of um, paved the way for the, for the girls now um, on the track or the road. Um, they, were, they were tough times. I was told that I was too big, I, was, I didn't have the right hair colour, I should have had long hair, I should have been skinny and blonde with long hair, you know, it's some of the things, you know, I'd never make it, um, there's other things at training camps all around the world. I think I'm a better, I became a better athlete for it um, and I wanted to show those people that I could do what they said I couldn't do and I think I did that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was quite a few years but like that I just thought this is, you know, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to keep proving myself? We were training in Budkin, which is one of the bases in Germany. Um, there was a velodrome. They had, uh, you know, an accommodation set up at the velodrome. The boys got to stay there. Um, but myself and uh, Lucy, Lucy Tyler Sharman or Lucy Sharman, um, we had to stay 20 kilometres away from the boys in a little hotel. Um, we had to ride to and from the training centre in the morning. We had to go ride home at night with our backpacks on. Uh, we, you know, we got to eat with them. Whether it was rain, hail or shine, we had to ride our bikes back home. Um, so we, we were treated differently. At the end of the day, my results proved that I 
could could be that rider that they said I couldn't be. So just to uh, for those who don't know, you won a couple of silver medals at the Olympics. One yep. in the sprint in '96 in yep. Atlanta, mm -hmm. when you were beaten by Felicia Ballinger, yeah. and another in the. Uh, the time 500 metre time yeah. trial at the Sydney Olympics. Yeah. That was a silver as well. Yes. And the winner was? Ballinger again. Okay. Um, I spent my whole career um, pretty much runner up or bridesmaid to Felicia. I mean, she was up until recently when Anna took the mantle of the most decorated female sprinter in the world um, with results at World Championships, Olympic Games and things like that. So um, it was always her and I. Um, I did get the better of her a couple of times at World Cups over in Europe, uh, but never on uh, Olympics or World Championships, unfortunately. Um, certainly tried my hardest, but yeah, she was uh, my ne nemesis the whole time. But um, I had a great relationship with her in terms of an athlete and um, not so much as a friend. She was very, she wasn't that talkative off the track, but um, you know, I think we had a great rivalry with each other and a great respect for each other. Yeah, yeah. the 500 metre is a thing of beauty. It's something that probably should still be on the Olympic program. Yeah. Or we shouldn't even say probably, it probably ought to be on yeah. the Olympic program. Yeah. Um, it's over in 34 or so seconds these days. Yeah. What was your time when you were racing the Olympic Curacao? Uh, you know what, I, um, I honestly don't remember. I, I kind of remember what my Olympic time was. Um, Sydney, Sydney Olympics, uh, the 500 metre was a bonus actually. Um, I wasn't sure whether I was actually going to ride it leading up into the, um, to the games. My, my training was all based around the sprint, obviously being my number one event. And um, Lindell Higginson had been trying, you know, training for the 500 metre time trial for the Olympics. Um, and then I'm not sure what came about or how it came about, but I got to be the starter. I got to race it. Um, I hadn't trained for, specifically for it for the, for the past 12 months. It was just all, you know, no specific start training other than the sprint stuff that we did. And that was kind of a, an absolute bonus and a, a bit of a shock, to be honest. Um, but that was the quickest time that I'd ever done. Um, I don't even think I'd be in the top five or six now, to be honest, with the times that they're doing. So. Um, uh, you know, I was definitely more of the sprint athlete, more with cat and mouse, the power thing. Um, I struggled getting off the line a little bit, but um, that was a, yeah, it was a real bonus that day. All these years later, we still refer to you as an Olympian based yeah. on your two second places. Yeah. Do you uh, live the life of the, of the ex-Olympian or do you um, <laughs> try to move on from that time and you're now in your professional life and working? Uh, yeah, I guess basically you'd probably say I've moved on. Um, I've, you know, as you know, Rob, I've spoke to you for many, many years about my struggles and how I felt about how I left the sport. Um, I felt, you know, a bit upset about things. So, you know, once you tell them that you're going to retire and it's time to, you know, move on, um, it's basically out the door you go and they never, you never hear from them again. So I struggled with that for a, for a long time. Um, and only recently have I, you know, turned 42. Uh, and I've just realised that I can't hold on to things like that anymore. I've got to move on with my life. I have a nine-year-old daughter who's, you know, um, looking, you know, being a mum is great, um, looking at different aspects. Um, she won't ride a bike, so I'm really disappointed about that. I've tried everything, but she just won't do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've moved on. Um, I still enjoy cycling. Um, I still work in the bicycle industry. Um, I ride mountain bikes a lot, I'm not so much on the road, I don't like battling Sydney traffic, um, but yeah, I guess I'm still an Olympian, I'll always be an Olympian, I'll always uh, try and keep involved somehow. Um, I wouldn't mind sort of maybe trying to get into, uh, you know, helping the younger generation of, of females trying to continue or, or get into the sport, I think there's been a bit of a, a lull, I mean we've got some great riders around Australia who are, you know, continuing to do well. I think it would be nice to have a little bit more depth um, and I don't know how, how we can do that. Um, I remember as a kid racing in country Victorian carnivals and travelling all around and it was such a great time. So many good friends, good races. It was a, an ex you know, experience that I wish those kids now or even guys and girls had. It'd be nice to somehow try and encourage more people to get involved um, in, in cycling in general. It feels to me with Melbourne Six Day and the Brisbane Six Days coming up next year that we're on the cusp of this resurgence, a bit of a renaissance in track cycling yeah. in Australia. Do you feel that that, uh, that, that wave is coming or not? Uh, I hope so. Um, and you're right, I think um, we've got a lot of um, 
events coming up that you know people can see how exciting track is and and you know maybe try and get a little bit of uh, enthusiasm back for track racing hopefully it's um it's started and and we can continue to to get momentum with it when you were racing i know the olympics um the Olympic stage is a different scenario to your country carnivals. Yep. But did you feel like an athlete or an entertainer or a mix of both? I mean, track cycling is a lot about entertainment. Yeah, to, you know, um, obviously starting out as a junior, it was I was there to race um, and, you know, to, to get better. But, you know, as, as I got older and, you know, I'd been to some world championships and things like that, I did feel that I was an entertainer. Um, and I felt that it was, you know, it was... It was important to put on a, a good race and, and, and things like that, but it was also to put on a show. I remember, you know, being based in Adelaide and pretty much, you know, um, every Friday or Saturday night there was, you know, Mike Turter had something on at the, the Superdrome and they were just packed, you know, sell out events and there was racing on all the time and he'd bring out um, internationals who would come and train with us for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and, and we'd race against them as well. But it was also about putting on a show as well as you know practicing tactics and things like that. So definitely showmen. And I think that's probably what's missing and where maybe the turn changed uh, is that people were more focused on racing, which um, don't get me wrong, I mean, we've got a race, absolutely. But I think there's a, a good way of combining racing and putting on a, on a spectacle for, for the uh, spectators. For me, um, having basically come straight out of school, straight into the AIS, straight into the national team, um, I, I didn't finish school. Um, and so now I find that, you know, wanting to go for other roles, you need to have a university degree or a piece of paper that says you can do something. So um, I guess that, that, that time after, so, you know, you retire and you, yep, that's it, it's time to do something different. Um, for me, I really struggled to transition from uh, athlete to everyday person um, and there was you know that was quite a few years of, of trying to find my feet um, lots of drinking alcohol and things that are you know feeling going through depression and, and things like that but I had a great network to get through that as well um, mm. but yeah that's it, it is the hardest time you think that you, you find something that you want to do and then you work out that no that's not what I want to do and it, it could take you quite a few years to find where you belong I did do an Ironman triathlon though, um, so and I finished that. I did Ironman Cairns uh, in you know 13 hours 20 or something like that. So you know I, I've done some crazy things, but I also uh, you know like you said, found many years of lostness, drinking, and then having the realization that I enjoyed being fit, the feeling of fit, um, and you know got back into cycling. I I went back to the track. I did. Um, track ma the World Masters Championships here in Sydney. Um, I, I think that was 2007 maybe. I actually can't remember. Um, won some world titles in Masters. Um, it was the only time I got to wear a rainbow, but you know, um, I remember passing someone and they went, oh, I thought she would have gone quicker. And I was like, well, I now have a full-time job. I'm not training seven days a week. I'm not an Olympic athlete anymore. So I kind of stopped with that as well because there's a little bit of too much expectation. But, you know, I'm, I'm, back, I'm back in the gym. I enjoy feeling strong and healthy. Um, I'm keeping my arthritis at bay in my knees, which, uh, you know, from all the training and things like that. And I'm enjoying being fit again and, and, and having some control back in my life and, and not feeling angry about cycling in general. Why did you feel angry about cycling? Is it, can I throw in two words and see how you respond? <laughs> sure. Charlie Walsh. Yes, uh, the two words. I found, I was angry at cycling, not necessarily just because of Charlie, Charlie Walsh. Um, he was certainly a very a big factor for me. Um, you know, earlier I talk about being, everything was difficult, being told I couldn't do things, being told I didn't look the way I should for a sprinter or, or and all this sort of stuff. He was very much part of that. Um, I felt angry at cycling a little bit, I guess, because once, you know, you spend all your years giving absolutely everything for them. Um, and then the moment that I decided that I, you know, it was time for me to, you know, to hang the boots up, as you say, you d they just basically, I, b I walked out the door and I had never heard from them again. Not even, hey, are you okay? Do you need help finding a job? 
how are you going transitioning into life? You know, I'd gone from living at the Institute of Sport at Del Monte where they told you what time to get up, what time to eat, what time to go to training, what time to come back from training. What do you do when you get home from training? You recover, you go to sleep, you have lunch, you get up and you go training again, you come home and you have your massage, or you go and see the physio or, and then you go to bed and you get up and do it all again the next day. It's all structured for you. And I spent 12 years of my life doing that from, you know, moving out of home at 15 and, and, and be, trying to be an adult straight away. Um, I really didn't know how to be a normal person um, and I guess I was disappointed that there was no follow-up in that. And there's something that they're working on now a little bit more. I still don't think they've got it right, um, but at least it's something they're very aware of. Um, and you obviously can see that you know, some people don't deal with it and you know, they, they go to the extremes of um, you know, taking their lives because they can't handle it or for whatever reason. So uh, it's, it's good to see that they are taking you know, notice of that and, and doing something about it. Um, but I guess that's my anger for it. Also, you know, I, I spent, you know, I was a sprinter. I was a cocky sprinter. Um, so I guess I probably expected a lot more than I probably needed to get from cycling. But I had that expectation that, hang on a minute, I've done this and I've done that. I should be getting this, this and this. Um, and as I got older, I realised that I, you know, only I can make those things happen, you know, not other people. Um, so a couple of years back when I um, went to Adelaide to race against Anna in a charity event for, for Westie, um, I had a moment where I was talking to Charlie and um, he apologised to me and said, I'm sorry that I didn't give you the opportunities that you deserved um, when I should have. Um, and I guess that was a turning point for me. Um, and from that moment on, I kind of let it go. Um, and I don't have any animosity towards cycling anymore and, and things like that. So it's not just him. Uh, there was a whole lot of reasons, I guess. Um, but the more I think about it, it's probably just me and my expectations of it. So I guess as getting older and realising things and, you know, having a family and having a, having a daughter and, you know, things, little things like that don't matter anymore. Um, you know, I did what I did because I love cycling. And if I had to do it all again, I would do it all again and I would do it exactly the same way. Um, if, it, if it was made easier for me, I don't know whether I would have excelled and, and, and achieved what I did. I think it was the extra added bonus or, or the pressure of going, stuff you, Charlie. I'm, I am going to do this and I'm going to prove to you that your stereotypes aren't what, what make athletes. But as we often say in these interviews, once a cyclist, always a cyclist. Yes. Um, you talked to me a bit earlier about your your cycling these days now coming on the mountain bike. Mm. Let's talk about mountain biking. Yeah. It's um it's a it's 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 fascinating in the tech terms, but yeah. it's just something that's sheer joy to do, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I remember the first time that I went out mountain biking and I don't think I stopped smiling the whole time. Um, and the guys that I was riding with said, you just did, you've just got the biggest grin on your face. It's so much fun, you know, you're riding through the bush and whether you're going, you know, 2k an hour or 20k an hour or 30 like some of the guys can, but, um, you know, it's just so fun to be out in the bush and, you know, riding in free space and not battling against cars and, and testing your own ability. You know, I, I'm not that great. Um, I go, okay. Can't do jumps and skids and stuff. Can't ha can't do a wheelie, but um, I just have the best fun. Um, I seem to relax. It's you know I go we go Tuesday night riding with the guys from work. Um, I'm lucky to work with John Odoms, who's you know pretty good on the mountain bike, um, and Tristan Ward too. He used to he used to work with us. So um, the mullet himself. Uh, but it's just so much fun. I mean, I love, I love watching your updates with your kids, you know, taking your kids out. They're so, they're, they're awesome. So it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I'm kind of glad that I got to, you know, ride and be who I was at a time when there was no social media and things like that. I think it would, um, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on you as a person. Um, you can't really be yourself a lot of time because you don't know who's around the corner, who's looking, who's doing this and that. Um, but I, it would have also been, I guess, nice. I would have liked to have a little, a few, you know, memories from it. You know, like the, the one thing about social media is it, it captures 
a moment and it's there forever now. Um, it's, you can't get rid of it. So I think the one thing that I miss from my career is I don't have any candid snaps or time away or little GoPro stills or videos from you know training rides with friends, which I see a lot of the, the girls and the guys doing now. Um, but yeah, I think um, I was probably better off in that time than now. Um, not that great with self-promotion. Mm. Yeah. To a point, I mean, yes, I've still got a bit of that cocky arrogance from, you know, the sprinting, um, but I'm definitely not as bad as I was. <laughs> it's probably a little bit of a, you know, probably annoying at times, I guess, to some people. There's this um, perception from afar that, and that once you achieve an Olympic medal, then there's just this flood of sponsorship opportunity that comes your way, mm. and that you therefore live off, uh, off your fame for the next couple of decades. Yeah. Did you make any money out of cycling? Oh God, no. Um, I had some great sponsors from, you know, the local area in Warrnambool and some, you know, bike sponsors and product sponsors and things like that. Um, but certainly didn't make any money of it. Um, I think I had enough money to, you know, basically as a general mid-level wage per week just to get by. Um, we still relied solely on, um, you know, the AIS weekly payout, which I think was about a hundred bucks at the time. Um, and then whatever else you could get in. Um, I actually worked a, a part-time job through a lot of the time in Adelaide as well um, during training and, and I worked started out at Bicycle Express was bike shop in town. Um, I also picked up glasses at a nightclub um, you know so it certainly cycling certainly wasn't my bread and butter. Um, it was you know something that I loved um, and I certainly didn't do it for the money because there is no money. <laughs> there was no money um, and I guess I don't know whether that had a lot to do with female, um, whether I wasn't the look that people were looking for. You know, I am the stockier, short-haired lesbian. You know, not everyone's looking for that to market their product, especially back in the day. Um, but, you know, again, like the same as before, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. I would do it all over again. I would still do it for the no money um, because I, I loved it and uh, it, it it was difficult to have that period afterwards where I hated it because I did love it so much and it's nice now to have that love again. Um, my office at work has a framed from racing suit from Atlanta to remind me and, and that's certainly something that I wouldn't have had two or three years ago because I didn't want to have memories of it. So times have changed, it's good, I'm happy again, I'm you know, riding my bike and hoping to, um, you know, I'd love to get involved somehow. Uh, even if that's just conversations with people and encouraging them and putting it out there every now and then, you know, get on your bike or whatever. Um, but it's nice to have that difference to change, but um, it wasn't about money for me. Hi, I'm Michelle Ferris and I'm talking cycling with Rob at Ride Media.